Austrian economists really don't put that much credence in individual elections, no matter how good the results make you feel. <laughs> um, because it's not that things are going to be easy from here, but because it represents a clear sign of ideological improvement in the American people. The American people have rejected the politics and government of the left, and they have embraced the more popular ideas of what helps the average American person. So we can say that there's very little doubt in my mind and many others' mind that this election was a signal about ideological change in the American public. What we're going to find out today, however, is that that election doesn't just simply wipe out all the errors of the past in our government or pave the way to nirvana and perfection in American society. We have a difficult road ahead as the speakers will point out. And in the long run, we really have a long ways to go. I like to think of the problems of big government like an onion. And on, with the onion, the skin of the onion that we see represents the, just the surface level problems, the actual political faces who are in charge, the obvious nonsense and nuisances that we hear about government on, in the media and in the news. But as we look deeper into the onion, as we go through layers of the onion, we see things like all the taxes, all the regulations, all of the bureaucracy, all of the control they, they have over our lives, all the interference they have over our lives, and as we get closer to the core of the onion, we see problems of a lot of looming programs, including the national debt. The national debt, obviously, as we all know in here, is enormous. It's been growing at an unsustainable pace uh, where, the, where trillions of dollars are being added to the national debt. And at the core of the onion is where the onion, where the new leaves are formed, where the onion grows and it expands um, ceaselessly. And the way I like to think of it, that's where the Federal Reserve is. That's where a big ultimate problem rests. The Federal Reserve is what allows and what has allowed government to grow enormous and all-powerful. Uh, that's also, by the way, the part of the onion that forms those compounds that makes us cry when we try to chop the onion. So I think that's a very useful analogy. Next time you're chopping onions, you could think, damn, that Federal Reserve. <laughs> the title of my talk is Voting on Drugs. And I'm specifically going to be talking today about cannabis, which is the actual name for marijuana, which is kind of a propaganda name the government gave it a long, long time ago. Now, this issue uh, would seemingly be very small and very insignificant from the point of view that we're really concerned about today. Um, it was an issue uh, in the election this time. Here in Florida, there was a measure on the ballot to change the Constitution of Florida to legalize recreational use of cannabis um, here in the state of Florida. It did not pass. It required a 60% uh, of the vote to pass. It was endorsed both by President Trump and Vice President Harris first time that's ever been done with two of the leading presidential candidates endorsing cannabis legalization. 
Uh, it turns out that um, Governor DeSantis was not didn't like the cut the state of Florida was getting in the whole thing, and he opposed it vigorously um, with himself and various departments, taxpayer money uh, to oppose that. So this time it did not pass. But again, it seems very, very small in the bigger picture of things, but it really is a case study in government. So we can learn a whole heck of a lot about government, about the current situation, the difficulties of changing the general direction of government, solving problems like the national debt, those bigger problems um, somehow seem more understandable and more tractable and more solvable once we see the legality of drugs like cannabis in the proper perspective. So it is big. It highlights the difficulties involved in ideological change. And the way Austrian economists see um, politics is that you have to change people's ideology. You have to change the way people think about how the world works and how government works and how society works in order to ultimately win elections and change policies. It also highlights the difficulties, indeed the futility sometimes of electoral change. So we see that problem as well in illegal drugs and their legalization. It also highlights, oddly enough, it highlights the importance of monetary reform. And in doing so, it highlights the importance of the work that the Mises Institute does. So I'm gonna take you back almost 100 years to 1937 when the US Congress passed the Marijuana Tax Act, sort of igniting or reigniting prohibition and the war on drugs. The bureaucracy of prohibition, which had been thrown out of a job, saw this as a way to reestablish their power and reestablish their job, frankly. Um, organizations like the uh, FBI and so forth uh, derive a lot of their power, authority, and budget, budget um, from the war on drugs and prior to that, prohibition. It also highlights the role of progressivism. We think of progressives as a new political ideology, but it's been around for more than a century. Progressives, in actually in the late 19th century, sought to use government to control the people. They sought to use propaganda to control society. And they were otherwise a very nasty, racist group that wanted to ex exert their control over society. <clears throat> when the Marijuana Tax Act came up for passage, science groups opposed it. They said cannabis was a very legitimate um, thing in pharmacology and in medicine. It was used in a wide variety of industries in the United States. My father owned a pharmacy and he had a lot of the old bottles and stuff, sort of a museum of pharmacology uh, in his pharmacy. And growing up in the early 1970s, I noticed that one of the large bottles said cannabis sativa. And I thought to myself, what in the world is that doing in here? And he told me, no, that was a perfectly legitimate thing that pharmacists used to make liniments, painkillers, and so on and so forth. Um, but in 1937, the bureaucracy and its propaganda turned away from this, and they started making up stories in order to make cannabis illegal. <clears throat> 
So propaganda was very much alive and well. As a matter of fact, when the bill to tax marijuana and effectively prohibit it was in trouble, the person promoting the bill came up with what we now know as the gateway hypothesis. That if we, in the gateway hypothesis is that if you smoke cannabis or marijuana, you will end up dying from a heroin addiction and overdose. That was simply just made up on the spot, on the floor, um, on the legislative floor. So right from the very beginning, it was propaganda and it was anti-science and it was racism. It was promoted as a way of, you know, getting back at Mexicans and blacks and so forth um, and keeping them in their place. Now, that pretty much was it in terms of news uh, related to the Marijuana Tax Act. It was con quickly converted into an outright prohibition. And yes, there were stories of famous people who were arrested uh, for marijuana. But it really wasn't until the 1960s uh, that where marijuana use was spreading, uh, the Vietnam War, people bringing the idea of smoking marijuana uh, back to the United States, uh, making it a big deal, um, and creating really an opposition group, the counterculture uh, opposition to American society, um, that the war on drugs was actually born. Uh, President Richard, Richard Nixon made it a prominent part of his reelection campaign in 1972. At the time, Gallup started um, polling Americans about their views on cannabis, marijuana, and whether it should be legal or not. And in 1969, it was the first poll, and it found that only 12% of Americans supported the idea of any kind of legalized cannabis or marijuana. And those numbers stayed very low throughout the early 1970s. Of course, that's a public opinion poll. I'm not sure how much anybody in here believes public opinion polls anymore. Um, but the, the, apparently the view of Americans was very, very low on legalizing marijuana or cannabis. And that stayed true. Uh, for uh, several decades, uh, certainly through President Reagan's war on drugs. Um, and this is kind of where I come into play. Um, I went to graduate school in 1982. Um, but in that environment, President Reagan had been elected president in 1980. He appointed George Bush, his vice president, to become the first drug czar, and they immediately began implementing uh, sort of a full-scale drive to uh, fight the war on drugs. They started using the military. They started using interagency task force um, to interdict drugs coming into the country. The first lady had her just say no campaign. And little old me was in the college graduate classroom. And I started to look at this um, issue as part of a microeconomics course. And I discovered what was to become or what was to be referred to as the iron law of prohibition. And the iron law of prohibition is simply that the more you try to enforce prohibition, the more you try to interdict anything that's illegal coming into the country, the higher the, um, the number of cops, the, 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 the longer the sentences, the more dangerous and the more potent the drugs will actually become. Okay, so that the iron law of prohibition states 
that the more you attempt to enforce prohibition, the more dangerous and the more potent the drugs actually become. And that ultimately became an important element, just one element in the battle for legalizing drugs. At the same time, President Reagan formed a task force right here in Florida to interdict the drugs. This is where they brought in the military. This is where they brought in IRS agents, FBI agents, customs agents, all sorts of, I think there was like 12 different agencies that were involved in this new formed effort to prevent drugs from coming into the state of Florida. Actually right here in Fort Myers, Florida, but also Miami, Fort Lauderdale and so forth. But that was on the ground here in Fort Myers. And what they found out with that task force was that they couldn't prevent the drugs from coming into the country. Even the bureaucrats themselves admitted that they couldn't stop all the drugs from coming in. And then the federal agents noticed that, hey, not only are we not getting them in, uh, preventing them from coming in in Florida, but there are actually more drugs coming in in Charleston and New Orleans and Houston and Baltimore and places like that. But one of the things that I noticed, and it gave me more support for this iron law of prohibition, was that the price of marijuana in Florida did go up significantly. But it was also simultaneously the first time that there were massive new shipments of cocaine into the state of Florida. So on the streets of Miami, it was said that you could hardly find a joint, but that the price of cocaine had been cut in half by all of these agents trying to interdict drugs into the state of Florida. So... By making it more difficult, the drug smugglers simply switched from the big bulky barrels, or not barrels, uh, bales of marijuana. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, not, yeah. You're just a farmer. Um, and they simply switched to the more condensed, more potent, more valuable product, which was cocaine. And then right after that, the crack cocaine uh, epidemic started and spread throughout the country. And, and of course, this has really come back to haunt us in, uh, over the last couple of decades in particular. I myself had a hard time selling this as a dissertation proposal, uh, something that would make the war on drugs unwinnable in theory, was not a very popular topic at Auburn University, which is a very conservative agricultural school. Um, and support for legalization in the country was still only in the low 20%. But there was a slow rising tide against marijuana prohibition. The externalities or costs of the war on drugs were building up the cost of law enforcement, the cost of the court system and prisons, the cost of broken families, the cost of people being killed, either directly in the business or directly as consumers overdosing uh, from the drugs or in the innocent bystanders who were being shot and killed uh, as a result of the black market resulting from prohibition. So the costs in the war on drugs were increasing. This was starting to weigh on uh, the American public. Decriminalization of cannabis started in the 1970s. So some Americans saw right off that the idea of prohibiting marijuana was stupid. Uh, these were mostly places in the Western United States, on the periphery, the places that progressives don't think are very important, statists don't think are very important. 
Um, and then there was also a lot of non-scientific discoveries about marijuana. The government, um, speaking about being anti-science, uh, the government simply suppressed any research uh, involving this former pharmaceutical drug called cannabis. They simply suppressed any research that would promote any idea that it could provide any benefit. But despite the suppression, people were finding out that, hey, marijuana helps with this condition or that condition. It helps people with cancer because it helps fight pain or it spurs the appetite or whatever it happens to be, or it calms you down. Uh, the AIDS epidemic was very similar. It helped people spur their appetite. It helped relax them and reduce their anxiety, uh, reduce their pain and so forth. So non-scientists were discovering that cannabis had a lot of really important medical applications that the mainstream medical profession had no answers for. And so in 1996, despite the effort of the government to suppress it, states started legalizing medical marijuana. Again, these efforts were limited to places in the Western United States and on the periphery, the places that the forces of big government aren't concerned with, they don't care, they don't plan to visit there, um, and so on. But they did happen starting in 1996. But the cost of this war and the spreading of the war um, and the iron law of prohibition, which resulted in all of a sudden methamphetamines spreading in use and in production throughout the United States, um, ravaging a lot of communities. The spread and addiction to opiates uh, throughout the United States spurred on by a lot of the pharmaceutical companies and uh, the medical profession uh, sort of endorsing that whole process. Uh, but, you know, they would addict people to opiates and then cut them off and leaving essentially uh, somebody who's addicted to a heroin-like substance with no alternatives but to turn to the black market. And of course, we've seen, unfortunately, thousands upon thousands of families ruined and thousands, tens of thousands of people dying from overdoses uh, for those opioid products. And then, of course, even the government caught on to the fact that their opioid prescription for America was not working. Uh, people were suing the pharmaceutical companies uh, for, the, for the practices and doctors for their practices. Um, and, uh, and so they cut off uh, a lot of people's access to opioid painkillers. And what we've seen replace all that is, unfortunately, fentanyl which is an even more highly potent, much more addictive and incredibly dangerous uh, substitute come into the market via the iron law of prohibition. So they crack down on things and the black market necessarily turns to uh, more dangerous, more concentrated uh, versions of the drugs or alternative drugs that are more concentrated and therefore easier to get into the country. So since 2012, which is about the same time that uh, we were in the midst of the opioid crisis, uh, reaching a pinnacle before the media was even bothering to report on it. Um, and then of course the fentanyl started coming in to the country about the same time, but um, recreational marijuana legalization was being passed, again, in places mostly in the Western states, mostly on the periphery. None of this was ever uh, supported by leading politicians. It was always 
the incumbent politicians were always opposed to these efforts on the part of the people. Most of them were, uh, you know, places where the people got measures put on the ballot and um, more or less forced the issue themselves, uh, being opposed by the incumbent politicians, being opposed by interest groups. So cannabis is typically opposed by the tobacco industry, the alcohol industry, and the pharmaceutical industry. Okay, I'm not sure why, um, but they're the groups that have been ponying up a lot of money to defeat these measures um, on the ballot. But nonetheless, recreational legalization has won. It's won over now the majority of the American population. The majority of the, of the American population now lives in states where essentially cannabis is legal for adult use. Um, and that has spread beyond just Western, um, un, relatively unpopulated areas and has moved into more populated areas. Heck, it's even, it's even passed at the legislative level in my state of Alabama. So, you know, we're usually way behind uh, the times and anything like that. So um, basically, the American people uh, could not rely on their incumbent politicians or leading politicians or the two leading political parties to make any of this happen. This was the uh, activities of grassroots Americans doing the work themselves, being opposed by very powerful special interest groups and winning, winning at the ballot box um, in a very atypical fashion. Now, what I'd like to point out in closing, however, is that, of course, there's a lot of work to be done just on this little, small issue. I mean, it's a very, very important issue for many Americans, many American families. Um, it's, a, it's a high priority issue. Uh, the ravages of drug abuse and addiction and overdoses and so on is incredibly important for a lot of people. But as a general issue, it's not as important in the overall scheme of things. But we still have the iron law of prohibition at work. We still have thousands and thousands of people dying from overdoses. Um, and, and so there's, there's a tremendous amount of, uh, of work yet to be done. There's a tremendous amount of harm that this policy is imposing, and yet we're still getting very little um, support from supposedly our representatives uh, in government or in Congress. They still, um, they now allow, I mean, they've, they did pass a bill in 2014 which restricts the federal government's effort um, in opposing medical marijuana uh, but they have not, um, you know, passed national legislation uh, to allow the states to act independently uh, on this issue. And they have not passed a law uh, to change the drug scheduling. Uh, marijuana is still classified as the hardest type of drug, which means that it has no medical benefit at all and that it is imminently harmful to anybody who consumes it. Now, that's a really hard statement to stand behind, but basically the two major political parties are still standing behind that drug classification when all the evidence in the world, I mean, cannabis is certainly any kind of drug, anything you put in your mouth is dangerous and potentially harmful, but the idea that cannabis has no med medical applications whatsoever is just patently absurd. And also the idea that it's eminently dangerous. Anybody who smoked one joint is going to be lost to society forever is, ox is obviously 
contradicted by the experience of hundreds of millions of people throughout time and around the world. So let's take a look, quick look back, because I said I'm going to touch monetary policy on this. When alcohol was repealed in 1932, they had to pass a constitutional amendment repealing the first constitutional amendment. So the 21st Amendment repeals the 18th Amendment. So we were in the depths of the Great Depression, but we were still on a gold standard. And what that meant, basically, is that not only were the American people in trouble, but American government at all levels was also in trouble. They were starving for tax revenues, just like Americans were starving for their incomes, their wages, and their jobs. So it was the depths of the Great Depression in which alcohol prohibition was repealed. So we still had to rely on the people, but you couldn't count on the Federal Reserve just to write checks to everybody to solve the problem. You could, the government couldn't just go into five trillion dollars of debt and just tell everybody to stay home. That just wasn't an option because we were on a gold standard and the gold standard promotes honest government and it promotes government to make the hard choices. If government wants our money, it's got to use it for the things that are deemed the most valuable. And obviously alcohol prohibition was not the most valuable. It was the least valuable, the most destructive of all government policy. So we were actually able to very quickly and very completely repeal alcohol prohibition after only 12 years. It was kind of the silver lining of the Great Depression, but the decision was forced. The government was, their hand was forced because they were on a gold standard and they just couldn't borrow an unlimited supply of money or they couldn't just print up uh, an, an infinite supply of money to solve all problems, to fill every budget, to pay every bureaucrat. So you might be and a lot of people wonder why Austrians put so much emphasis on the gold standard. And we're going to talk a little bit, obviously, today about the direct problems that the gold standard solves. But with the lesson of prohibition, we realize that being on a gold standard not only does a lot of great things economically for us, but it helps keep government honest and it forces government to change itself to follow the dictates more of the people than of the progressive politicians. Thank you very much.